Hello, Mike. How are you doing today? Good. Thank you, Jeff. Good to be here. Thank you for coming on the show um, and welcome to Men's Mental Wellness. This is a substance abuse edition. Uh, I'm Jeff Nupel, a psychiatrist. If you don't know me, this is my good friend and colleague, Mike Furnett. I've worked with Mike for many years where I practice rural psychiatry in a clinic. He was doing substance abuse counseling and uh, I greatly respect and trust Mike. And uh, uh, Mike is a guy who cares about people and is able to connect with them in a non-judgmental way. And I think he's really been effective at what he's done from what I have seen over the years. And uh, he also has a good sense of humor. And I, I don't know, Mike, you told me a couple of jokes over the years. I don't, I, one of them you told me was, uh, why is it that Jack Daniels bottles aren't round or cylindrical? And what, what was the answer to that? They're square so they don't roll off the seat in the truck next to you on the floor so you can't get at them. Yeah. There you go. I remember you telling me that. And the other thing you told me was a little more serious, but um, very true, actually. And that is, why do people use drugs? Because they're good. That's what I remember you telling me. I used to, I used to, they had me teach at D.A.R.E. for a long time. And I kind of got kicked out of D.A.R.E. because I'd take the kids aside and I'd leave the parents and the cops away and I'd tell the kids, you know, the reason you shouldn't do drugs is because they're very, very good. They may ruin your life in the end, but in the beginning, it's wonderful. So they didn't like that. You're supposed to say drugs are bad. Right. No, but I think that's a really good point. And, you know, as humans, we get into all kinds of maladaptive behavior and we do those behaviors for a reason. And I think that's the point here. And that's why people use drugs or, or alcohol in an excessive or unhealthy way is because there is some something rewarding about that experience or it covers something up there, at some level, at least in the short run, it's serving a purpose. Right. So. Yeah. Um, so anyway, is there anything about yourself you wanted to mention before we go any further? Just a brief history. I, I spent about 20 years on the streets doing drugs and alcohol in and out of jail and the rest of the stuff that goes along with it. And I got clean and got all grandiose and decided I was going to be a substance abuse counselor. So I got my degrees and I thought I was going to help people. Little did I know that at best they were going to help me, that mm -hmm. they helped me stay clean for 28 years while I was a substance abuse counselor. And I've been clean now for 33 years. I respect that. That that's uh that's uh a good life lesson there. You know, we start out with our egos, right? And then uh mm -hmm. we get checked a few times and uh certainly I'll, I'll have to say as a psychiatrist I've had a similar experience as far as my patients have really been my greatest teachers and that's that's been very humbling. So, um so the first question I wanted to ask was, you know, um People might be watching this anywhere in the world, but in the U.S., since that's my frame of reference here, alcohol, at least, uh, is a part of daily life for a lot of people, uh, people who don't necessarily have a drinking problem, but it's part of our culture um, at celebrations or just to relax or whatever. Um, and, you know, we go all the way from having a drink here or there to, you know, hardcore drugs. But I think what's confusing sometimes for people is if you do like to have a drink or two here or there or something like that, how do you know when you really are developing a substance abuse problem and when you should seek help? I, I, I've always liked the old adage that if your substance use has caused tears for yourself or others, then it may be a problem. Mm. And then, then you should look into it. You know, other people are saying to you, you know, like we're concerned about this. You know, it's not always easy to take that advice, but look at that, you know. Um, if you want to do the test, the easy test is that you set some limits for yourself that are reasonable, that don't involve enough of the substance to affect your judgment. Mm. And you set those limits, like if it's alcohol, like maybe three or four drinks, you set those limits and if you can't keep the limits, then you got an issue. Mm -hmm. And then you need to quit. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty simple. And you can do the test yourself. I think a lot of people might tell us we got a problem. But for us to recognize that for ourselves is a difficult thing. 
Mm -hmm. and, and so I like a self-test, you know, rather That's than good. everybody pointing the finger at us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm aware that, you know, a lot of people start out, you know, if we're talking about alcohol with an alcohol problem early in life, and it becomes obvious that they're struggling with alcoholism. But there are a lot of people where it kind of creeps up on them, and they might be middle aged or something before they start having a problem. So alcohol problems can develop later in life, right? I just wonder right. if you could say more about that. It, I've, well, there, you know, it's, there's some talk about a genetic predisposition to alcoholism or addiction. That may or may not be true. I'm not so worried about that, but I do know that if you drink enough long enough, it'll get you. So, and, and for each human being that, that amount and that time is different. I've seen people um, that I've worked with that developed alcoholism in their 60s and had no problems with anything prior to that. But then when they retired, they're alone, they start drinking and more and more, and then they run into difficulties. And you came, you were briefly in retirement and came out during the pandemic when everything was locked down. And I think it's pretty common knowledge that lots of people increase their alcohol use during that time. Did you see that in your practice? Yeah, people were, you know, scared and alone and isolated. And so uh, developed more drinking problems and more substance abuse problems with drugs. Yeah, I saw a lot of that coming in. Mm-hmm mainly because of the isolation people win is the stress and mm -hmm. um, the, all, all those factors that come into it during the pandemic. And a lot of people are still trying to get out of those bad patterns they got into during the pandemic as well. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, so if someone has a problem with drugs or alcohol, what would some of the common triggers be for relapse that people should be aware of and what are some of the common ways that people can cope with them or, you know, um, navigate those? No, I think um, relapse triggers are particular to the person. Each person has their own set of things. Like feelings are a big thing. Stress is a big thing. Um, I've seen a lot of people over time, they get sober and they're doing real well and, and then they want to the trigger is I want to reward myself because I've been doing, I've been sober for a year and you know, I'm just going to have a couple of beers and then off they're off and running again because their ability to control isn't there. And that doesn't quit. Even if you've been sober a while, um, the yearly events like birthdays and weddings and anniversaries and the seasons and all those things can be triggers. Mm -hmm. I would tell pe people that, um, you're going to have triggers. You're going, you're going to have urges to relapse, but urges will go away whether you use or not. Now, that's easy for me to say, mm -hmm. but it's true. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if you keep that in mind, it helps. Okay. Another thing is I've, I've always tried to talk to people if they're, if they're really saddled with a lot of these overwhelming urges, like let's take drinking, for example, that it can be obsessive, you know, it's the least smallest thing happens and somebody wants to pick up a drink i personally like an abuse mm. if 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 i don't think i'd be sober today if it wasn't for an abuse mm -hmm. um an abuse is a medication that really does nothing unless you drink and mm -hmm. it makes you violently ill and mm -hmm. you can't get down enough alcohol to really get drunk before you get really sick mm -hmm. so it, so for, for me it took the alcohol off the table it wasn't a bargaining chip anymore. It was off the table. I can't drink because I'm going to get sick. I know because I tried it, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a beautiful thing for somebody who really, really wants to stay sober. Mm -hmm. and you want to take the temptation off the table, get on an abuse, mm -hmm. drink on it once. You won't do it again. So that's interesting. Like you know, I've prescribed an abuse many times, but it was a long time ago. I don't think I've prescribed it for at least 10 years. I don't know if people are using it as often. So I guess one of the questions I have about it. So yeah, it's a medication. It does nothing when you take it, but if you drink on it, it makes you sick. So one of the the workarounds for a lot of people is they just stop taking it, right? So how do you how if people are going to be on an abuse, how can they have sort of the checks and balances in place in life so that they don't just say, well, I'm going to drink this weekend, so I'm not going to take it Thursday and Friday. Well, one of the things about an abuse is, is that it loads up in your system. 
And then even if I quit taking it today, you know, depending upon the person and their metabolism, I might have to wait, you know, four, five, ten days before I can drink. So I got some time to think about it. Do I, you know, you have to plan your drink way ahead. Mm -hmm. So I got some time to think about whether I want to do this or not. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I always tell people, don't take abuse unless you absolutely want to quit drinking, because then you'll mm -hmm. bargain with it, just like you're talking about. It's not a it's not a medication for a bargaining chip. It's a medication for people who really want to quit drinking and you stay on it. You make it like for myself. I made a commitment that I was going to stay on abuse for a year and a half mm -hmm. before I even decided I was going to do anything different. Mm -hmm. So I could get a year and a half of sobriety in me and then I can make a decision. I, mm -hmm. you know, it's been 33 years. I still have some abuse as a souvenir in my medicine cabinet to remind me. Mm -hmm. So what about an accountability partner along those lines, like a, like a romantic partner or a family member or friend who um, you sort of have an, an agreement with that, you know, you take it in front of them or something like that, or does that to you indicate that you're not all in on quitting? Yeah. Well, you can do that, but you, now you're, now you're setting yourself up for an argument about stuff, you know, but I mean, if you if you have a partner that you trust and is willing to help, by all means, give them permission to ask you. To, you know, have, have you been taking your antibiotics? Mm -hmm. uh, use them as as needed, but don't set yourself up for um, difficulties in the relationship because of your medication. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So, yeah. so tying in with that, you know, one of the issues, of course, that goes with any kind of addiction uh, is loss of trust, because it, along with addiction comes a lot of behavior of manipulation and lying and things like that. And friends and family can love you to the end of time, but they get tired of it after a while and they don't want to hear it anymore. They don't want to hear the excuses. They don't want to feel like you're going to take advantage of them and so on. And that's a really tough situation to be in. And I've worked with a lot of patients who are in that situation and they really do want to stay sober and clean and they want to repair those relationships. What advice do you have for people in a situation like that? Well, First of all, you have to you have to look within yourself and ask yourself, what are the reasons that I gave them? What are my behaviors that caused them not to trust me? And, mm -hmm. and just be in the reality of it all that, you know, I mean, I stole from them. I called them names. I pushed them. I shoved them, whatever it is that, that caused them not to trust me. Mm -hmm. And they have that right. In time, they may trust you again, but you have to also realize that they may never trust you again. And that's part of reality, too. Sobriety and recovery is not easy. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of things. There's a lot of um, bridges that we burn that aren't going to be repaired. Mm -hmm. And that includes with loved ones. Mm -hmm. but, but so they get to trust when they're ready. If you know that then just let them be instead of trying to force trust. It's difficult to force trust with people. Yeah. Um, it's maybe, about, it's about doing, not saying, right? Right. Um, yeah. It's maybe if you, maybe after you've been clean a year, they might go, well, you know, he's actually going to make this and they might actually start to trust again. It takes some time. Mm -hmm. How many times have we said during our addiction that I'm going to quit and we quit for two weeks or we quit for a month or we quit for three months and then we go back again and the whole thing starts all over again. And we, we've just uh, it, it compounded the lack of trust by that. How many mm -hmm. times have we done that? How many times have we promised things? How many times have we said, I'm not going to do that again and then did it again a month later. So mm -hmm. how long is reasonable for someone to expect trust to come i always say you know if you get clean a year you might get some back if you're lucky if you haven't lost it permanently mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah it takes a lot of time yeah um the uh you have to learn to trust yourself is one of the big things if if i'm if my um well-being and my belief in my sobriety is hinged on these other people loving me or trusting me or believing in me i'm like not in a good position mm -hmm. but if i'm doing this for me and not for them it's all got to be for you it's got to be mm -hmm. because 
this is what I want because you might lose those relationships after you get sober. I've seen mm-hmm. I have countless people's marriages end because of sobriety. Mm-hmm. You know, you get sober and now I got this sober person mm-hmm. with me and I'm used to this drunk person and neither of us know each other. And now we can't live with this. Mm-hmm. I've seen a lot of people's um, relationships die mm-hmm. because of recovery instead mm-hmm. of the opposite way. They mend instead of recovery. Mm-hmm. Generally, um, the die is cast, right? Mm -hmm. By the time you get sober, the die is cast in the relationship. The deeds have been done, and that can't be undone. And sometimes the damage is permanent and irreparable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really takes a toll, doesn't it? Uh... Yeah. And then... um, one of the hardest things about recovery is 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 to gain the ability to be in your own skin, to sit in your own skin and be comfortable there, rather than needing all these things from the outside and all these people from the outside to comfort me. That's why a lot of people don't get sober because they they can't live with themselves and all the chaos they've caused in the world with their relationships and inner chaos they've caused with themselves is difficult Mm -hmm. self-hatred is rampant in early recovery and Mm -hmm. lots of people just can't sit with that for very long without using it yet Mm -hmm. i mean it's 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 the self-hatred that really causes a lot of difficulties so we have to learn to live in our own skin and, and be okay with who we were and who we're trying to become and that's obviously a process, not an event. How how do you help people navigate through that part? Because that you've probably seen that happen over and over again. Yeah, there's lots of people um, in recovery that um, you know, like an AA or NA or twelve step meetings or even rational recovery or whatever it is. There's lots of people that have been through similar situations that you can talk to them and they'll say, "Yeah, I know that you know this is what worked for me." Mm-hmm. And different people, different things. It's, there's no one answer to all that. Um, self-compassion is hard to come by even for people who aren't addicts. Mm-hmm. So sure. it's, it is a process. But there's other people that have been through similar things that you can talk to. There's a, um app called In the Rooms. It's got all different kinds of stuff. Everything you ever wanted to know about recovery, all different kinds of meetings. And it's got people on there you can just chat with and talk about how you're feeling. And mm-hmm. they can kind of guide you through the rough spots a little bit. Mm-hmm. But um, one of the hallmarks of addiction is that we don't like to ask for help. Mm-hmm. Remember in treat, can I tell stories? Sure. I remember, I remember in treatment one time, years ago, they would do funny things to you in treatment. They said, I lack the ability to trust um and i lack the ability to ask for help so they tied me to my roommate for two weeks and if i wanted chow i had to ask him if i wanted to go to the can i had to ask him so i had to learn to ask for help by asking this nobody else would talk to me i had to talk through him well it didn't teach me anything it just made me mad but but i did become i did come to understand that uh, asking for help in this situation was a good thing to do it helped you with self-awareness. Um, right. Yeah. Right. Well, it's also a problem, you know, on the, the channel men's mental wellness. Uh, I think that a lot of us men struggle with too. We want to be self-sufficient and we want to act like at least to the world that we've got it all together and everything, which of course isn't always true. And so um, it's, it's a big step for a lot of us, I think, to get to the point where we can actually reach out and ask for help when we need it. Mm-hmm. Difficult. So if someone is working on their sobriety or, you know, recovery uh, from alcohol or drugs and they're trying to navigate their friendships and relationships and they're not really getting the, the uh, they're not really getting the understanding um, and support that they really need for that to be a healthy relationship, 
How does that work? How, how do you, what do you suggest to people in situations like that? Because just like the marriage situation you mentioned where the spouse or partner is used to the other person being intoxicated all the time, the dynamic changes in these relationships as well, right? Yeah. Well, one of the difficulties with me was I had all these friends that I had been around for years and years and years, and we'd done all kinds of things together. And when I got sober, mo I was the only one getting sober. None of those guys were getting sober, and it was, and ladies were getting sober. But uh, in the end, I came to discover that my sobriety was stepping on their toes, mm. that they didn't want to be around me too much because it made them look bad or however they felt about that, but it wasn't comfortable for them for me to be sober. Mm -hmm. So you, usually when you're in treatment, they'll say you got to change your playmates in your playgrounds. I found in the long run, I didn't have to do, they changed theirs. They didn't want to be around me anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't tell them to get sober. I didn't tell them they had problems or anything like that. I wasn't preaching at them, mm -hmm. but it was just difficult for them to have a sober person in their life continue in their continued use right it's mm -hmm. like you know it's a invisible finger pointing at them so that's one of the difficulties you have to um, navigate is that you know all these people are not going to understand uh sobriety because they're still using and the people who don't use who have never had substance abuse problems have difficulty understanding why a person gets a brain disorder where they get so obsessed with the substance that it ruins their whole life and mm -hmm. how can a person do that and how you know, mm -hmm. weak or immoral are they that mm -hmm. that they would let that happen to them? It's not about weakness or immorality. It's it's about a brain disorder, really. Mm -hmm. And if we understand that personally, that I'm not responsible for my addiction, but I am responsible for my recovery, it helps. And, and mm -hmm. we can't make people understand us mm -hmm. or understand why we did what we did or why we're doing what we're doing. Mm -hmm. But we can try and understand ourselves better. That helps. That makes a lot of sense. What about, you know, you know and be and be honest with people, you know, um, that don't understand it. Tell them, you know, like, well, this is kind of what I'm doing right now. It's not easy for me. I don't expect you to understand everything, but mm -hmm. this is the path that I've chosen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. It's, it's very, very complicated. What about, you know, a lot of, a lot of guys I've treated uh, who uh, work in industries like construction, where there's sort of a culture of drinking and sometimes other substances, um, people need a that job. And if, that, and if that's what they do, how, how does that, how, you've probably worked with a lot of people in situations like that. What do you usually recommend? When I first got sober I was doing construction I was a carpenter we were building hotels and that was a difficult time you know like everybody's going out after work and having beers and they're getting stoned at work and you know coming in all hung over and that was difficult for me mm -hmm. um you know it's it's easy to want to say well you know you guys need to get sober because you got problems too but that doesn't help anything so I didn't do that but the I had to personally it was so difficult for me that I had to choose another direction in life. I couldn't be around all those people. And not that, not that they're good or bad, mm -hmm. just that the environment I, my wasn't struggle healthy. was immense to, you know, that doesn't help my urges and stuff. Luckily mm -hmm. I was on an abuse. I don't know if, I don't know if I could have stayed sober doing construction, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm not telling people to change what they do, but you may have to look at that. Sure. Um, whether the environment you're in all the time is healthy yeah. for you. Um, well, and, and men, you know, we're so insecure. But, so the difficulty is what's our, what's my identity going to be if I get sober? Am I going to identify, you know, as a recovering addict or as a recovering alcoholic? And I, am I going to be able to tell people that I'm a recovering alcoholic? Because that word has such negative connotation in society mm -hmm. it's like mental illness and alcoholism people are scared by those things mm -hmm. and the, everybody's got their own picture in their head about what an alcoholic is mm -hmm. and um for me it certainly wasn't me i had a mm -hmm. picture of somebody there's always somebody in your group who's worse than you are mm -hmm. you can point the finger at and that's important to have 
mm-hmm. when you're struggling with substance abuse problems is they have somebody in your group mm-hmm. that's worse than you that you can point the finger at. Unfortunately for me, mm-hmm. I became the person that everybody was pointing the finger at. Oh. I didn't have anybody to point the finger at in the end. And then now I got a problem because all my drunken friends and all my crackhead friends are pointing the finger at me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's a difficulty. But what 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 is our identity going to be going forward in recovery? That's what you have to look at is that who who am I who am I gonna be? Mm-hmm. Am I gonna identify as a recovering person? And recovering people don't hang around a bunch of people that are drinking. Mm-hmm. Sorry. That's mm-hmm. all it is. Yeah, that makes sense. What about substituting one addiction for another? I know things sneak up on us sometimes and we we want to we, we totally convince ourselves we're on a better path in some way, but actually we're doing something just as destructive or or it might end up being that way, but it just doesn't look the same as what we were doing before. Right. Well, that's always the fun one. You know, the you know, for me, I don't have any I don't I don't smoke pot, I don't do any dope, I don't do anything anymore. Um, but there are other things that don't have anything to do with mood altering substances that you can addict to do gambling, sex, relationships, all different kinds of things. You have to kind of observe for obsession, right? If, if, uh, it becomes, a uh, obsessive in your mind, you think about it over and over again, and then it becomes it, it, it interfere in parts of your life, then you got a problem with it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and the other thing I was thinking about when we asked this question was about, um, I've seen lots of people that say, well, you know, yeah, I got a problem with drinking, but I've never had a problem with weed. So now I'm going to start smoking weed. And recently mm-hmm. I've been running into people who you have a problem with heroin, but they didn't have a problem with meth. So they started doing meth to get off of heroin. And now, you know, where are we going with this? So, you know, it's, for me, I don't use anything, and I'm very careful about, you know, um, what my attachments are so that I, I don't, mm-hmm. you can get attached and addicted to almost anything. Mm-hmm. So I'm careful of watching my attachments and, and how much energy I'm putting into these attachments, whether it's, you know, vehicles or collections or gardening or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Um, everything in moderation, I've heard somewhere. I don't mm-hmm. know if that's mm-hmm. a true statement, but... Mm-hmm. I wish I could say sounds like uh, again perfect and did everything in moderation, but I can't. So, but it sounds like self awareness again, which is so important. Uh, Right. The more we can develop that, because I think a lot of times we fool ourselves. Um, We want to think we're on this path that's better, and it may not be actually. Yeah. Just look. And and the other thing is that we need to keep in mind that everybody has shortcomings. And everybody has imperfections. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just leave it at that. We're kind of all in this together. and We all have imperfections. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I don't want to point the finger at anybody else. And so I don't want them pointing the finger at me. Mm -hmm. Just how it is. We're all kind of works in progress. All we can do is be better versions of ourselves than we were yesterday. Um, Yeah, it's not a competition. It's it's, a... just within ourselves that's our our biggest battleground really um you mentioned heroin and meth and you've been doing this uh as as a well both in your life experiences when you were using but as a substance abuse counselor lots of years and you've probably seen a big change in the landscape in uh, rural wisconsin uh, of what drugs people are using and and the meth and heroin problems and so on. I was just curious if you had any comments about that. Yeah. Well, um, well, I can't speak from all of rural Wisconsin. I can speak where I work down here in Southwest Wisconsin. Years ago, you rarely run across anybody that was addicted to heroin. And then as time went on, heroin became a big thing. It got cheaper, got more available and people were bringing it in and showing it to their friends. And then there was more heroin addiction. And then that got kind of out of control for a while and then um, got more expensive. And so people switched to meth and now meth is a big thing. And um, meth has really created uh, difficulties in people's lives around here. You know, I um, fortunate enough to go into the jail and do a group in the jail. And it's just, it's just, 
I don't know what the percentage is of a high percentage of meth people because it's a difficult addiction. Mm-hmm. And meth is really difficult because of how your brain reacts to that and, mm-hmm. and the length of time it takes once you stop using f- for to get any, any sense of normalcy in, in your emotional well-being is just difficult and the only thing that you can do is use more you know that where it all goes i mean they meth people are smart they know exactly what's happening Mm -hmm. but they can't stop because of the emotional stuff that goes on Mm -hmm. when they try and quit it's Mm -hmm. bad Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it's difficult so yeah i've seen things things go from you know just weed to heroin to meth um now, I don't have, you know, much experience other than that because I've kind of been retired for a couple of years. But, so I don't know what's going on too much other than what I see in the jail. So what about anger? Anger is a normal emotion. We all have it at times. We all get upset. Uh, and for men, it's often the only it's only the only uh, socially appropriate way that we can express ourselves. At least that's what, what a lot of us were taught growing up. Right. And how what do you see uh as the uh, interplay between addiction and anger and anger management and so on um i see a lot of people um trying to get clean who have significant anger issues or or they they describe as significant anger issues including myself but i see it as really control issues you know it's like Mm -hmm. this overwhelming desire to you know control our situation in life or other people or things or whatever it is uh, Mm -hmm. that results in anger. We get these um, ideas of how things should be or how people should behave. And when they don't, then we get mad Mm -hmm. Uh, in recovery. You got to work at that real hard because Mm -hmm. that is a great way to relapse. Just get mad and get drunk. You know? So um, I like um, mindfulness to help with, anger issues Mm -hmm. there's all kinds of things online about mindfulness practices that's what you know you're just kind of looking at your mind and how it works and where the and just just looking at the anger and trying to figure out you know how to just cut it down a little bit and mindfulness helps a lot with that a meditation practice helps a lot with that so whatever makes sense to somebody try it but mindfulness I've seen a lot of great things happen. People mm-hmm. just keeping an eye on their mind and things. Mm-hmm. Just trying to, rather than, it's kind of like equanimity. Rather than judging a feeling, anger, for example, as good or bad, it just is in the moment, mm-hmm. but it too will pass. But what we do and the decisions we make and the behaviors we do when we feel that anger are what causes us difficulties. If we can just live with it in the moment, mm-hmm. not judge it as good or bad, just it is. Mm -hmm. what i'm feeling right now but we often want to um label it which Mm -hmm. causes us difficulties so it's a non non non-judgmental awareness of what is uh yes um that helps a lot um and you got to keep in mind you know this these for men these control issues are unbelievable and cause us lots of difficulty so we have to look at you know what kind of person are we are why is it that we have this overwhelming need to control all these things or you know what are we afraid of or you know what's going to happen if we don't try and control everything is it going to be okay is it not going to be okay Mm -hmm. i mean some it's it's hard to settle out anger issues without the help Mm -hmm. so counseling comes in handy mindfulness comes in handy we have to kind of change our world view and and our and our self view in order to solve some of that stuff. That's a great way to say it. I think it just helps a lot of people too to know that they're not alone. That this is actually pretty common. A lot of people struggle with this. It's pretty pretty normal, actually. Maybe not severe anger management problems are aren't everybody's issue but everybody's got anger to some degree and at times and i've heard the saying resisting what is creates suffering and that's always stuck with me as a as a great saying and the thing is though being able to really not just understand that intellectually but to take that saying and then 
make sense in your own life out of it so that you don't resist what is that's where the hard work comes in isn't it right well and i i've seen a lot of people um use anger as a tool to manipulate you know if if i don't want people to get close to me all i gotta do is be an angry person all the time and nobody wants to mess with me if you, if you really manipulate your world mm -hmm. with your anger and how people view you with it mm -hmm. and just to keep people at bay or you know mm -hmm. to not be vulnerable which is a big issue for men this this, it, this business of being vulnerable or even expressing feelings. I can express anger, but I don't want to express any other feeling. Mm -hmm. But you know, what is the feeling behind the anger? Am I afraid? Am I, am I mm -hmm. hurt? Mm -hmm. Whatever it might be, we got to kind of um, look at it and um, see what's behind it. Sometimes, you know, where, where does it come from? Is it my need to control things, mm -hmm. control people? Mm -hmm. or is it that I'm hurt or is it stuff from my childhood or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned an important word there, vulnerability, you know, and I think um, that is tough for us men in general. Um, sometimes when I start talking to guys about this topic, um, I think they're worried that it sounds like a threat to their masculinity somehow. Vulnerability. It just, it just, it just, there's something about it they're just not comfortable with. I just wondered what your uh, thoughts were about that. Well, <laughs> men spend a lot of time trying not to be vulnerable and trying not to be known. We don't want people to have our secrets, what we really feel, what we really think. A, a good example of how it comes to be this way is, um, you know, if you take, you take um, a five-year-old little girl who's in the corner of the room crying, what most in this society, what we're going to do is we're going to go over and pick that girl up and ask her what's the matter and how, how can we help fix this? Mm -hmm. But if you take a five-year-old boy that's in the corner of the room crying, at least out here in Southwest Wisconsin, we're going to tell him, if you don't quit that, I'm going to give you something to cry about. Mm. And we don't recognize feelings in men. We tell them not to do that, you mm -hmm. know? And so we, 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 um, reward young girls who are expressing feelings with love and affection and kindness and tenderness. We reward young boys who are, are expressing feelings with um, anger, threats, right? Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. demean them. Mm -hmm. We tell them they're sissies. And so then now we're, now we're all grown up and we want these two people, these two sexes, they have relationships and we want these men to be able to talk to other men and to talk to women. Well, the messages we give is to people as children. I know this is changing a little bit, but the message we give to people as children is not helping. Right. So if we look at, you know, what we were taught, maybe we can unteach ourselves. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I have nothing to say. That was, that was a great point. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, it's not easy. Um, but there's a lot I think parents could do as they're raising children, and I've raised children also. And it's it's uh, kids don't come with uh, an instruction manual, and uh, I think most parents, even if you're a, the type of person who reads about things and tries to educate yourself, we're winging it to some degree, right? And we kind of go by what we know and everything. And do you have any uh, particular suggestions for? people who are raising children just based on some of what you were talking about? I could, you know, I, I really, I struggle with that because it's different from when I was raised, you know, now there's all this social media and everybody's got a phone and everybody's got all these apps and everybody's got Facebook and all these other things. And those are what guide behaviors and thoughts and responses. And so I'm not, I'm not good with all that stuff. So I, I really am not qualified to say in this in this generation of what you should do. I could say what I what I would do, but that's not helpful. <laughs> what about though, just raising uh, raising boys? Since you brought up that example, uh, as far as emotions and so on, just so that uh, boys have a better chance of growing up and being emotionally intelligent people who have better relationships with everybody and know themselves better and um, so I on. Think I think imagining their little girls that, you know, uh, 
he's having difficulty, he's crying, what, what will we do in a situation if, if if it was a little girl that we would be more likely to protect and to, um, you know, have tenderness and mercy for and, and to do that to our little boys too. It's mm -hmm. not like, um, you know, if you give uh, a little girl comes home and somebody stole her lunch money or whatever, or something happened at school, dad's likely to get out of school and raise a fit. Mm -hmm. But a little boy comes home, somebody stole his lunch money or something happened. The dad's like to say, get a stick and hit him. Mm -hmm. So we give them the message to be, to, you know, to get back at people that are hurting you. Whereas we tend to protect little girls. And, and maybe I'm over exaggerating or maybe I'm oversimplifying things. But I, I find that to be true that, you know, we want little boys to be aggressive and we want and we don't want little girls to be aggressive mm -hmm. so maybe we can tweak that a little bit both ways right? mm -hmm. yeah that makes sense um did you have any uh, thing else that came to mind today that you wanted to bring up uh to, that you thought might be useful for people you know i wanted to talk about 12-step programs a little bit if i could yes right. oh uh yeah any sort of do-it-yourself um not that it's necessarily do it yourself, but as opposed to going to a clinic and making an appointment, right? There's other things right. people can do. So things have changed since the pandemic. Before the pandemic, there were lots of AA meetings and NA meetings all over the place, and they were well attended. The meetings, I I still go to meetings, um, but the meetings I attend, there's hardly anybody goes anymore because things have changed to online. So there are all kinds of things online, like in the rooms where you can go get some help and you can be around like-minded people who are struggling in their recovery. And people who have had a lot of recovery who aren't struggling can give you advice on, you know, what they did that worked for them. And you can pick up what works for you and leave the rest. But if you do go to 12-step programs, you, you the, the G-O-D word is in the literature. Mm -hmm. So they're... They're not faith-based, but they are spiritual-based. Um, and so you got to have an open mind. If you're going to go to 12-step meetings like AA and NA, you're going to have to have an open mind and not judge everybody. There's people in meetings that are pretty sick. There's people in meetings that are pretty healthy. Mm -hmm. And we don't kick anybody out for anything. Mm -hmm. So even if they're, you know, misbehaving at the meeting, we don't kick them out. We don't kick them out for using or drinking at the meetings. So, you know, it's just like you got to keep, if you're going to be in 12 step programs, you have to keep an open mind mm -hmm. and you have to check your judgmentalism, which is not an easy thing to do. Yeah. Um, my, I've, I've worked with thousands of people. What I've seen happen to the people who get clean and stay clean is they all have a different story, but they all have the same sentence. I don't know what happened, but it was something spiritual oh. that I got clean. So I think a spiritual direction, a spiritual journey, I'm not talking about whatever tweaks somebody's you know, balloon or whatever it is, whatever makes sense to you. Mm -hmm. A spiritual direction is really key to recovery because it's going to give us all kinds of things that we can use to work on ourselves and to, you know, be okay with ourselves and change ourselves and find a direction. Just doing the next right thing is a spiritual direction mm -hmm. as far, as best you can. Just do the next right thing instead of the next wrong thing. I think most people in general have a still small voice within them mm -hmm. that says, don't do that, but we don't listen. So listen to the voice within you. Mm -hmm. It's, there's a direction inside you. There's a spiritual direction in there. And you can listen to it and nurture it and become better, become more healthy. But don't rule out a spiritual direction in recovery. I think it's one, I think it's personally, I think it's the most important thing. I'm in actually our, really glad that you brought that up because I've actually had a lot of patients who were sort of dabbled in AA or NA and they just told me, you know, they talk about a higher power and everything, and I don't believe in all that stuff. I'm just not comfortable. I don't want to go to, I don't want it to be like I'm going to church. What right. What would you so, tell someone who's in the very beginning of considering that, and, and they're just not sure where they're at spiritually, or they just say maybe they're 
I'm atheist or agnostic or whatever. Whatever you are is fine with me. I would tell them this story. So I was struggling with all that. I was raised Catholic, and that's another story. But <laughs> you know, but so so I I wasn't you know this God stuff did not sit well with me, and so I was complaining and about that you know in recovery. And then uh, a guy took me aside. He said, "Well, can we talk about that?" And I said, "Sure." He said, "Do you know if there's a force for evil?" in the universe. I said, yeah, I do. I've been it. I've been locked up with it. And I've seen human beings do the most horrendous things to each other in my addiction time. I've seen it. He said, are you sure? I said, yeah, I'm sure. I'm positive there's evil. I mean, it works through other people. He said, then you already got spirituality. Hmm. What you got to do is pretend there's a yin for that yang. Mm -hmm. That if there's a force for evil in the universe and you know it exists, then there's got to be a force for goodness. Pick that as your higher power. Just pretend there's a force for goodness in the universe. And you don't have to describe it or anything. Just pretend there's a force for goodness, just like a force for evil. And the next time you want to make a decision on what to do, ask yourself, what would this force for goodness have me do? And do that. And that's how I started. And it morphed into a, a wonderful spiritual journey for me. But I, that made sense to me. You know, you got to you gotta go to a place where, where you, you can't preach to people. You got to go to a place where they understand something. I think most addicts, most alcoholics understand evil mm -hmm. very well. Mm -hmm. So then they can understand this force for goodness and start there and, and, and see where it takes you. Just I love I love how you explained that. That makes a lot, of, a lot of sense. A lot of sense. Worked for me. So awesome. So I was I was pretty judgmental about everything, you know, and I wasn't going to listen to people. But, you know, if you talk to me about what makes sense to me, you know, what I've witnessed in life, then I can, you know, kind of listen to you a little bit. Mm -hmm. That's great advice. Thank you so much, Mike. Anything else today, Mike? Well, let's see. Let me look at my notes. Uh, the answer in the end is compassion for yourself and all living beings. That is the answer. And that is the key to happiness. That much I do know. But neither of those things is easy to come by. But those are things to work on, compassion for yourself and all others, despite behaviors, right? Because we're all in this together. I agree. Thank you so much, Mike. I really appreciate you coming on. And uh, maybe people have some uh, questions um, that they can post, and uh, maybe we can do this again sometime. So Wonderful. I'd love right. to. Ask all the questions you want. I may not have the answers, but, you know, I can talk big. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks, Mike. Have a great day. Yep. Take care.